Good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me? Can I get a wave if you can hear me? Happy Sabbath and blessings to one and all. For all those that are on um, the blackout screens, happy Sabbath. For all those that are on YouTube or on our website, happy Sabbath to you all. I take it we've all had a good week because we're all here. I'll, we'll begin our service with hymn number 300, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, Let Me Hide Myself in Thee. Number 300. is cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy raven side which flowed be of sin the double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power, not the labors of my hands, can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me Saviour or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyelids close in death, judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. At this time we'll have our prayer. Let's bow our heads. Let us pray. I will kneel. I will invite those of you who are able to join me to kneel also as we seek the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, everlasting Father, Lord, we humbly bow in your presence. Dear Father, we, we approach your throne of glory and of grace, knowing that there is there is no other God but you. Lord, it's you who, by the power of your words, by the power of your voice, Lord, you brought whole worlds, planetary systems and life into being. And Lord, it's because of your, your power, your, your might, but Lord, ultimately your love towards us, that we worship you on the Sabbath day. Lord, we have so much to be thankful to you for. And we're thankful to you that we have the life and the strength and the energy to be able to, to worship you. We're grateful, Lord, that there is a sun in the sky, that we have air to breathe, that we are around our family and our brethren. But we are grateful that even though we are separated in proximity, that we have technology whereby we can come together with the brethren. Lord, above all, we are grateful that even though we're living in a world of sin and death and heartache, we have a faith and a hope which cannot be shaken, a faith in Jesus Christ, whereby when we were yet sinners, Lord, your love for us was so much that rather than leaving us to wallow and to die ultimately in sin, you sent your only son so that there, was, there would be no reason why any of us should die but that we could look forward to spending life eternal with you one day. 
Lord, it's, it's this hope. It's this hope which keeps us going. It's the love that we have received from you which keeps us going. And Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for the things that you have done for us. Thank you for the things that you continue to do for us each and every day. Lord, forgive us of when we are neglectful or when we take these things for granted, Lord. When we wake up every day knowing that it was not our alarm which woke us up, but it was you, dear Lord, who gave us life. Thank you so much. But Lord, we recognize as we come that there is a there is a divide between you and us, dear Lord, a divide brought about by sin. And so, Father, as we come, we just pray that you would cleanse us from our unrighteousness, that you would forgive us of our sins, Lord, that you would take away the, the bent towards sin, that you would give us a new heart, a heart of flesh, a heart which is on the wavelength, receiving and responding to your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that by your strength, you would allow us and help us, cause us to do the things which please you. May that come from the heart. Father, you you raise up your church that we would be a, a beacon in a cold, dark world. Well, Lord, the world has never been colder or darker than it is right now. And so, Father, may your church glow, shine brighter than it ever has done before. Lord, may we realize that the church is not the building or the four walls, but the church is me. The church is my family. The church is each and every one of us, dear Lord. Help us to have an experience with you whereby when we are in the presence of other people, Father, your spirit shining through us would just be so attractive to other people that they would be desperate to know the Lord, the God that we serve. Father, we thank you that even though we have no strength in ourselves to absolve ourselves from sin, that you have done everything possible. And so, Lord, we just cling to the name Jesus Christ. And we thank you for what you've done through him. Lord, I want to pray for our, for our members, for your members, as we go through uh, unprecedented times. Lord, somebody said to me this week that they are tired of saying unprecedented because they've been repeating it for such a long time. Lord, I just ask that you would continue to draw near to each and every one of us. Father, may you dry the tears. May you heal the, the hearts. May you give hope where there is just despair. And Lord, may we look away from the things of this world, away from the things of ourselves. May we be fixed firmly on you. You, Lord, who knows no limitation, who knows no bounds. And Father, we know that although the, the present is uncertain, the end is assured with you. Father, I would like to pray for those who are sick and suffering at this time, not just in the church, Lord, but there are literally thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of people around this country and around the world who are sick with a disease. But I pray for our the hospital staff. Lord, I pray for the NHS workers working under great, great strains, dear Lord. I pray for those who are sick, Lord, who are fearful of this disease, not knowing if and when it will strike them. I pray for those who have lost loved ones. Lord, I pray for my mom who is sick at this time. Lord, I just leave her in your hands, knowing that there is, there is no vaccine, dear Lord, which can supersede what you can do for the human body. There is no blood vessel. There is no antibody which is not subject to you. And so, Father, I present her and those like her into your capable hands, knowing that you can heal. You do heal, and you are a God of healing. Lord, we thank you in advance because we know that you desire good things for your people more than even I do. And so we leave them in your hands with faith, dear Lord. Father, I pray for our speaker, our own pastor, Pastor Dan, that I just ask that as you have spoken to him in his preparation, that even as he speaks to us, Lord, that you will continually speak to his heart. May you hide him behind the cross, Lord. May you 
place your words into his mouth. May he speak words of hope, of rebuke, of encouragement, of love. And may we, each and every one of us, Lord, be changed more closely into the likeness of Jesus Christ as a result of what we would experience here today. May your Holy Spirit move on the hearts of the hearers, Lord, on the internet, far and wide, and may we each just become a little bit more like Christ. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness, for your patience, Lord, and we just we leave everything into your most capable hands. Thank you, Father. Above all, Lord, we pray that when you would come, when you would break through the clouds in your glory, may each and every person under the hearing of my voice be ready to meet you, to spend eternity with you, Lord. And we just we thank you. We thank you. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have our children story. Very good afternoon, children. It's good to see you, although I can't see you and you can see me, but you can hear my voice. Uh, today I'm going to share with you a, children, uh, a story for you. It's quite unique and different because after I speak, you would not hear the, uh, the characters speaking, but you will see a video and how it is. So the story is about really the wise and the foolish builders, okay? Now the difference between these two is not because one is wise, one is fool. That's not the point there. What makes a person wise and what makes a person fool is actually dependent on his actions and his choices. Okay? So in the video that I'm going to show you, the difference between these two, okay? The wise could have been fool or the fool could have been wise. What made him wise or fool is dependent on their choices, dependent on their accepting the instruction. So uh, please be very attentive as I share with you the story. Now, as you can see in the video, there was a bit of an instruction there at the beginning of the video in the tree, the two of them look at it, but the other got it and he obeyed with it. But the other one just, ah, 
that's not important. And then they proceeded in building their houses. And as you can see, the results differ. One built on the rock, the other one built on the sand. And when the uh, flood came and the rain, the torrents came, one was, uh, his house went crashing. And so Jesus is saying to us that, we hear his words, all of us hear his words. We have the ability to obey them, okay? And it's up for us to obey them. It's not just about hearing it, it's about following and obeying them. So two men, which one are you? Is it the wise or the foolish? But you can't really do, we would always say, I want to be the wise, but it's actually that the wise could have been foolish or the foolish could have been wise. What makes the difference is they're hearing the word of Jesus and they follow and obey and apply it in their lives. And so children, I encourage you to be friends with Jesus. Make him your best friend. Talk to him, speak to him, hear him and follow his words. Thank you so much. I'll pray for you. Bow your hands, please. I pray, Lord, that you will be with our little children you have entrusted into our care. Give us the ability and the knowledge and the wisdom as we rear them up and uh, teach them of your word. We pray, Father, that we as parents will demonstrate to them, to our children, that we love you and that we indeed obey you. And help us, Lord, to teach them in the most loving way so that uh, we will become the reflection of who God is into their eyes. Thank you, Lord, that you will be with them and that you protect them from any harm and danger. We dedicate them to you, O Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. We will shortly have our meditational. And after that, the next voice we will hear will be from our speaker for the day, our new pastor, Pastor Dan. I'm sure that for some of us, it will be the first time that we are spending time in his presence today. We're grateful for you to be here with us. And pastor Dan is a husband of one wife, a father of one son, a keen sports person, a badminton player, a cyclist, and above all these things, uh, a committed man of God. We look forward to your ministry in God's word today, Pastor. Thank you very much. Amen. It's a statement of faith. My life is in your hand. I know what I can take it. Well, actually, the temptations, I mean, the trials and the testings that God gave us actually are very much calculated by him so that we will be able to take it with his strength. And at the time of testing, um, God allowed it so that it will, it has the purpose of growing us into his likeness because we cannot grow the fruit of the spirit. We cannot develop our character unless we have those testings and those trials and so the objective of this thing is to grow us and to develop us in him it's a privilege to be with you um, here for the first time on a sabbath day here at bilston coming from my previous district four and something years the other was five and something years and the other one was 11 and something years i'm not sure how long will i be able to stay Bill Stone, only God knows my life is in his hand. Um, and so we are going now straight to the point, And I ask you to bow your heads as we seek the Lord's blessing. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, please be with me in the waiting congregation. Thank you so much, Lord, that you are here with us and that you will be our experience. In the name of Jesus, we pray and thank you. Amen. We are now going into the year 2021, according to our calendar. 
we follow the Gregorian calendar, of course, but the Israelites' official calendar is the Hebrew one. According to the Jewish counting, entering into the year 2021 AD is year 5781, and the new year started in September. And if, and I say if, if the Jewish reckoning of the age of the world is accurate, it means that we only have 219 more years before the earth would age to 6,000 from creation. If the Hebrew reckoning is correct, it could be inaccurate too. And the Lord may wrap up things next week or next year or tomorrow. We don't know. We don't make calculations. We just need to be prepared anytime. We just have to look properly at the world around and you will see that things are rapidly changing. The world is more and more becoming unpredictable and uncertain. And we understand that we have been living in the end times. We are in the final years of Earth's history and that is certain. And at these end times, even in the middle of a pandemic, we have to understand that faith and prayer should not replace common sense. Our pioneers who experienced the pandemic of cholera in the 1800s believed that fasting and prayer must not replace the effort to understand the disease or to defeat its threat. They believed and acted upon the fact that the Lord will not hear prayers from those who ignore and disregard preventive action. I trust God. I pray every time I journey near or far, but I wear my seatbelt. I trust God and I pray for His protection, but I lock my door day or night. I pray to God when I exercise in the mountains with my mountain bike, but I still wear my knee pads and elbow pads and I still wear my helmet. Before David faced the giant, he chose five smooth stones. And everyone knows in the aftermath that David only needed one stone to bring the giant down. But the inspired word of God carefully recorded that he chose five smooth stones from the stream into that pouch that he brought. Faith and prayer is not a replacement for common sense. Now the clock is ticking. Time is not going back. Time is moving forward towards the fulfillment of all prophecies that can never be mistaken. You see, history confirms biblical prophecy. And prophecies fulfilled as witnessed by history are among the greatest evidences that the Word of God is dependable. And not even an atheist can deny the evidence. Of course, they can choose not to believe. Anyone has the freedom to always harden their hearts. Whenever we say Happy New Year, we ought to thank and be ready to say Happy New Person. We seem to focus much on the year we don't think much of our personal development. Happy new person by God's grace. Not necessarily the outward appearance, but the inner person. Because our inner selves must be transformed constantly so that each year that progresses, we become the better person that we are, better than before. Loving and lovable. Less arrogant, less assuming, less selfish less holding grudges, but more understanding, more humble, more knowledgeable in the Word, more wisdom in applying knowledge, less backbiting, more respectful. Christians who remain unforgiving and cannot move on are indicative of selfishness. They just focus on their hurt rather than the hurt that they cause others and Jesus. They only see the defects of others, but they don't see their own defects. We all hurt Jesus, yet He freely forgives us when we come to Him, and He does not announce our guilt. He welcomes us freely whenever we repent, and it is a fresh start for us all over again. People who are not willing to come into terms or unwilling to come and reason together with others for the purpose of reconciliation and peace, because they think they're always right and correct and would not want any counsel they will slowly but surely slip into a ditch where the Holy Spirit would forever leave them. You see, our salvation hinges on our acceptance of the Holy Spirit who will make us more tolerant to our neighbor's mistakes. So we become less and less fuzzy, striving for excellence but not into perfectionism, slow to anger, quick to forgive. That is the essence of God. 
that is the essence of the incarnation, the birth of the Messiah, God with us. And the incarnation of God speaks of hope and of life when darkness is cast out by the presence of the light. We have to be very positive to declare that with the help of God, we will be the new people without and within. Not just new year, but new people, new outlook, new attitude with renewed hope, faith, and love. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. You know that very well. Now, if you are difficult to love and you find it hard to love others, then you know that the Lord is not finished with you yet. And in the same way, do not finish your relationship with others just because of a pity statement. Let's stop moaning for others' shortcomings. God does not even do that for us. Continue to invest in loving others because that is what God is doing for you and for me personally every day. Let us build ourselves up in Jesus Christ. Now here is the passage of today's sermon. Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and it beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, in the scriptures, whenever you see, therefore, you know that it is a concluding remark after a series of discussion that goes before it. So Matthew 7 is a continuation of the discourse that started from Matthew 5, the Sermon of the Mount. Now, he is concluding, he is wrapping up what he said all about the Beatitudes, that is the foundation, the motto, and the bylaws of God's kingdom in the hearts of every believer. And chapter 6 and 7 are wisdom on practical Christianity, and now verses 24 to 27 is a conclusion so unique because Jesus uses a short parable as his conclusion. A wise man who built his house on the rock. A foolish man who built his house on sand. And now in this passage, Jesus is saying in his concluding remarks that the foundation upon which we build the house of our lives is of primary importance. Because the foundation is what holds everything up, holds everything together. No matter what quality of materials you use, no matter how carefully you join the frames together, no matter how skilled your craftsmen may be, if the foundation isn't solid and stable, your house will lack integrity. You see, structural integrity is dependent on the foundation of the building. In my previous experience of purchasing a church building, we made sure that we did not sign the purchase until we had an expert under a registered company who inspected the building and confirmed the building structural integrity. They didn't just say the building is fine. They had to put their name and company in the documents and they put their signature in signifying that the building will stand through the rains and storms. The foundation by which the building is built upon is key in the integrity of the structure. The Leaning Tower of Pisa here in Italy looks like it's going to fall. The scientists travel to this town of Pisa every year to measure the building's slow descent. They report that this 179-foot tower, which was built in 1173, moves about 1/20th of an inch every year and is now 17 feet out of plumb. And that is why they have to do some renovations to it in order to save this 800-plus year old tower and prevent it from collapsing. This tower has been closed for almost 12 years from 1990. During that time, engineers completed a $25 million renovation project designed to stabilize the tower. Interestingly, the tower is called the Leaning Tower of Pisa because it is located in a place called Pisa. And the word Pisa means marshy land. Marshy means swampy and soggy, which gives us a very clear understanding as to why 
the tower began to lean even before it was completed. The soil here in Pisa is just too soft for a huge and heavy building. But the main anomaly of this building is the fact that its foundation is only 10 feet deep. The reason the Leaning Tower of Pisa is leaning is because it's built on a faulty and insufficient foundation. And so in the parable of Jesus, there are a few things that we need to see. The first thing I would like us to notice is this. The man who built his house on the sand did a lot of things right. For example, he was evidently diligent, he was energetic, and he was a hard worker. You see, it's not easy to put up a house, especially on those days when there was not much convenience of powered tools and machinery. In other words, he was not a neglecter of religious things altogether. This man, he heard the teachings of Jesus. He heard well enough to understand. He was greatly influenced by what he heard. As a matter of fact, he felt the importance of making provision for the future, and that is to build a house to protect himself and his entire family. And so he selected a site, started a building, and didn't quit until he was finished. There was really nothing wrong with the house that he built. He spent long, hard hours on it. However, he neglected to calculate the trials this house would have to endure. The sandy soil in the dry season, you see, appears to be solid and strong. And so he thought this is sufficient. He thought of the present. He forgot to select a sure and safe foundation for the future. And of course, you know already the meaning of this. The sandy foundation represents our own righteousness and not God's. The dependence upon our works instead of God's. Building a house in the sand means one has a formal religion but without salvation. Christianity for social status only but no meaningful relationship with Christ Jesus. The Word of God has no effect in their lives. Others want to rely on their wisdom to guide them. The man who built his house on the sand did a lot of things right, except for the foundation. The guy had no power tools and machineries. There was no Home Depot, Wix, B&Q, or City Hardware to deliver his orders. He had to carry a stone and cut the wood and form the bricks out of clay. It took him long, hard-breaking labor, and he did not quit. He persevered until the structure was complete. He did a lot of things correctly, and yet in the end, all his hard work means nothing. We need to point out that good works should not be a substitute or a replacement for the righteousness that only God can give. Just like the man, he built his house. All the human effort was there. But the righteousness of Christ alone will make a person and anyone's home stand. That is what it means to be building on the rock. Some people who do not believe in God champion humanitarian works. They are good works, of course. However, these good works are only in the level of humanistic endeavors. You see, human beings want to prove that they can solve their problems without the need of God. They want to prove to the world that we don't need God whatsoever. This group of people are the strongest force on earth against Christianity. Why? Because they would capitalize on good works and humanitarian endeavors. And they will point the world as to how many billions of pounds and dollars they have given away to help alleviate the conditions of humanity. And at the same time, point to the little involvement of many Christians in doing humanitarian work. And one has to understand, though, that part of the Christian mandate is to help the needy. However, helping others through practical and material things alone is not the only purpose of Christianity. If helping everyone and if humanitarian actions is all that there is for Christianity, then Jesus should have stayed longer than just three and a half years, healed everyone who got sick and raised the dead, not just Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, and a widow's son at Nain, but everyone from their grave. Why didn't Jesus heal everyone or raise everyone 
from the grave. Why didn't he prolong his ministry beyond three and a half years? It is because Jesus' main mission, his main purpose is to preach the gospel and to bring spiritual healing upon everyone. He won souls for God's kingdom. He didn't just come to give someone longevity. He came that those who will accept him may have life, abundant life, and above all, eternal life. The truth of the matter is, even the costliest service and the most vigorous labors won't save anyone if the foundational motive is something other than the love of God. If anything you or I do cannot be traced back to our love for Christ who first loved us, it will eventually become worthless. It's like a drug lord who dumps a portion of his ill-gotten money to the charity and even to some churches. It's similar to a dishonest politician who embezzles money from taxes and supposedly help the poor from his own pocket. It's not about our name or legacy or for the record. It has to be the love of Christ that naturally constrains us to do good works. The foundational motive, the driving force, is Christ Jesus. People can do good deeds for very selfish motives and reasons. They could be doing all these things for all the wrong reasons. It may not be obvious what those reasons are, just as it may not be obvious what kind of foundation is underneath a house. And if I may address our young people as well, if you are young or single, you cannot just be with someone simply because of their looks or their talents. When you age, looks will be gone. Talents are just the beginning. You need to look at the person's attitude and the character. Something that are not apparent and obvious. Something deep beneath the surface. You need to be wise to know by now that love affairs that flare up so easily and instantly burn out just as fast. And more likely in such a relationship, you are looked at on the basis of superficial qualities such as your appearance or your figure rather than on your character and on your true worth. You have to understand that not everyone stays fresh forever. If all you are after are the superficial things, you are not a wise builder. You are building your home on a sinking sand. Something beneath the surface is really important because when the rains come, when the storm arrives, when the bad weather visits, they become the test of what sort of motives or foundation we have built our lives upon. The house built on the sand was good, solid looking. To all appearances, it was well built. It didn't fall down right away. It wasn't obviously defective. As long as the weather was good, it was perfectly adequate and all right. But when the heavy rains and the torrent came, only then we know there was wrong with it. And I want to highlight this, that just as this man's diligence was no sign he was doing the right thing, his apparent and immediate success were not signs that he was building his house correctly. The man managed to accomplish something really impressive and worthwhile. But the thing that cannot be seen is the lack of true solid foundation. And this brought his whole wonderful house collapsing. Now let's look at the wise builder. This is how Jesus described him. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The storm hit both houses, and this wise man's house received exactly the same testing, the same challenges, the same rains, the same torrents. How did this man differ from the foolish man? Did he use better materials? Not necessarily. The difference is in the foundation. His foundation was not a sinking sand, but a solid rock. While one man built his house in the sand, the other man dug deep. He dug until he reached the bedrock, built his house on that rock, and the rock does not move. It is unchanging and it is stable. So what does it mean then? These are the people who hear the word of God and believe it to the point that they build their lives on it. They are not shallow. They dig deep. They seek Jesus with diligence. 
They search with their hearts and minds. They compare their lives with the life of Christ. They talk about His love and His grace. They don't talk about people. They are not discouraged because of people. They know that everyone is struggling. They know everyone needs a Savior. They talk about their lives in comparison to the life of Christ. They talk about Christ's goodness to them more than the heartache that people gave them. They move on from pain because they let Christ heal them and they realize Christ has pampered them with His love. The truth of the matter is, no pain experienced is bigger than the love received. If you have not realized that, it is perhaps because you are not counting the favors the Lord gave you and you have only noticed the visible things that others possess rather than on the deeper, the more profound things that you have received. You have to understand that a life built on the sand requires no commitment, no sacrifice, no faith. The only walk, the easy path. Sand builders like to have instant results, instant rewards, instant satisfaction and pleasure. They are shallow people who love the heights but hate the depths. They appreciate the looks on the surface but are oblivious that something beneath is much more important. They build their lives on self-will, self-fulfillment, self-sufficiency, self-satisfaction and self-righteousness. And you know what? Our greatest enemy is self and how to conquer this self. To build on self is to build one's life on a sinking sand. You know, the soil in the Western Hemisphere is not conducive for building a Christian home. The climate in the West, its culture of consumerism, is not conducive for building a good spiritual home. The Western culture has so much elements on it that will erode the Christian life. As you know, God is banned in public places here. It offends the vast majority for you to mention God in the public. The accepted norms are now alien to the Word of God. Promiscuity is fine for as long as one has contraceptive. Marriage is undermined. Sexuality is confused. Anyone who chooses to establish a Christian home here should not underestimate the importance of securing a solid foundation if they are to see their children, the next generation, remain in faith for the next few years. The moral decadence, the moral decay around, represents the sandy soil that our society is built upon. We came here, we wanted the proverbial greener pasture. But not long after we have settled, we have realized that we did not get a green pasture. But lo and behold, we get a sandy soil. What do you do when you settle in a sandy soil like the West? It is difficult. You know that the most faithful members of the church now are the first generation who came here and they are dropping in numbers because of their age. To live here and remain faithful without losing our first love is extremely difficult. But I will start with an illustration pertinent to our passage and to encourage us all. Please come with me to Dubai. Behind me is the world's current tallest building. It is Burj Khalifa. 828 meters from the ground up to the sky. Literally, the soil here in Dubai is just too sandy. It is impossible to build a skyscraper like this without the help of some advanced technique and careful planning. As you can see, the tallest building in the world is standing in a sandy soil, tough and strong. What did they do and how? The engineers revealed to us that the center of its support system is a core with bundled tube design buttressed by three wings. It's a strong system, but the question is, what supports that support system? The answer is obvious. It is the foundation the unsung hero of every solid and strong building. But how did a strong foundation happen to be underneath Burj Khalifa? They designed with ingenuity. They had to overcome a lot of difficulties. They had to 
contend with a deep layer of very weak bedrock and highly corrosive salty groundwater. And so they drove 192 very thick steel support piles to a depth of 50 meters and they poured 45,000 square meters of concrete, much of which was salt water resistant. And then they protected the concrete and those many thick steel support by a corrosion inhibiting cathodic protection barrier to prevent the salt water from eating up the foundation. Bird Scalify engineers said in their slogan, impossible is nothing. That is a human ingenuity and achievement. But of course, we know that before the second coming of Christ, an earthquake so strong will come that even the mountains will move into the ocean. But that is a different story altogether for another time. Looking at here now at Bird Scalifa, yes, in the context of building considering the type of soil and how corrosive the underground water of Dubai is, the circumstance of building a skyscraper in Dubai is impossible. Yet the engineers overcome this and said impossible is nothing. They do this by laboring so meticulously first and foremost on the foundation. And so back to the question as to what do we do when the proverbial soil of the West is not conducive for our spiritual growth? The answer is found on what intentional effort you put on and how diligent you are in making sure that a solid foundation is made available beneath you. Daniel, Sadrach, Meshach, Abednego were young boys uprooted from Zion and brought to the soils of Babylon. They ended up in Babylon in captivity. Jeremiah told them in advance in his prophecy that was never heeded by the citizens and the leaders of Jerusalem because the message of Jeremiah was Jerusalem is going to be defeated. And then he would in essence say, welcome to Babylon. Build your house in Babylon. Settle in, plant gardens, marry there in Babylon for you will be in captivity. And many of us left our countries wanting to go into a greener land, a Christian country. Little did we know that we end up in Babylon. But in Babylon, God was able to use Daniel and the three boys so mightily that even their captor, the king Nebuchadnezzar, would have to bow down eventually to the God of heaven. In Babylon, the greatest prophecies of the Messiah and his kingdom, his dominion, his acts, his plans, are given in Babylon, although it is Babylon, yet it is in that land that the prophecies concerning the world's superpowers, one after another, are foretold in advance until the most powerful one, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, will return and establish his dominion forever. In the soils of Babylon, God revealed the future. Good things still happen in Babylon even in the sandy soils of Babylon. The tallest building in the world stands in one of the sandiest soils on earth. And the builders are saying, impossible is nothing. And so with us too. When we look at the godless, selfish, human-centered society around, it looks bleak, gloomy, and impossible. But when we turn to Jesus and ask him of his opinion, he would say, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With Jesus, impossible is nothing. Even in Babylon, you and I can be used by the Lord so long as we meticulously seek and labor hard to dig and to find the bedrock. So long as one is intentional in digging past the loose soil of human wisdom, reaching deeply into the bedrock, the solid rock, our spiritual lives will stand through the downpour, the torrents, and the floods of the Western life. It looks impossible to live godly lives and raise godly children in Babylon. Of course, it is impossible if our spiritual lives just flow with our work and with what is left with our time. We need to be very honest. It needs some intentional effort 
prayer and divine intervention so that our lives would not simply revolve around our work. It needs a lot of kneeling. Our financial commitments are enslaving us to moonlight that we end up having no time with ourselves and with our God and no time for the children in leading them in our devotions. Let's be honest. In Babylon, children are babysit with electronic gadgets with less and less meaningful use of their time and less and less productivity and genuine interactions. To be Christians, building a home with rock foundation needs intentional effort, a lot of sacrifice, and a total surrender to God. Nobody produces godly generation by accident. Lastly, there are only two builders in the story. Only two alternatives. When it comes to matters of ultimate truth, there are really only two options. You're either trusting Christ, obeying His words, following His example, or you are not. One way leads to life. The other leads to death. There aren't many ways. There are only two ways. Christ or something else. You either build on the solid rock or you build in the sand. And there was a short story long ago of a ship that was wrecked in a furious storm and the only survivor was a little boy who was swept by the waves onto a rock. The boy sat there all night long until the next morning he was spotted and rescued. Quivering and cold, his rescuer wrapped a blanket around him and said, You must have been shivering all night alone on that rock. Yes, said the boy. I trembled all night, but the rock did not. Even in the midst of life's thunderstorms and hurricanes, even when the circumstances around seem at their darkest, Jesus is the rock. He is our firm foundation. He will never tremble. Please build your life. Build your house in Him. God bless you. I think it's a good idea to unmute, just to say amen, even those who we cannot see or are block out, please. You know, this was, I believe with all my heart, that this was a message from the Lord to each and every one of us. Right? Pastor, thank you for allowing the Lord to use you today. And... I know within my heart that God has answered my prayer. I've listened to the message that he has given to you to give to us today. Let us take our hymnal and sing along with the hymn um, 531. 531 will build on the rock. Let us turn to hymn 531. We'll build on the rock, the living rock, on Jesus, the rock of ages. So shall we abide the fearful shock, when love the tempest rages. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock, we'll build on the We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock, on Christ the mighty rock. Some build on the sinking sands of life, on visions of earthly treasure. Some build on the ways of sin and strife, of fame and worldly pleasure. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. On Christ the mighty rock. Oh, build on the rock forever sure. The firm and the 
true foundation. Its hope is the hope we shall endure, the hope of our salvation. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. We'll build on the rock, on the solid rock. On Christ the mighty rock. Amen. 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 Felix. Am I praying? Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you that you have been the rock, the solid foundation for our lives. Help us to stay with you. May we draw others to you as well so that they will find a solid rock. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the many trials. Thank you for the many testings. Thank you for the difficulties. We count them as blessings. They just simply prove that we are strong in you. Help us, Lord, to overcome whatever it is ahead of us and help us to have confidence in Christ Jesus alone. Thank you for blessing Bilston Church, its family members, friends, and around its community. I pray that those who are hearing my voice as well will be blessed by you so that they will be drawn closer to Christ Jesus, the solid rock. Thank you for hearing our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you all very much. You know, it is a well spent Sabbath so far and we give God thanks and praise. Thank you.